All right, I've got that we've hit 1 p.m. on the dot uh, Eastern time, 10 a.m. Pacific. Let's get started. Welcome everyone to this uh, breakout session on using circularity to achieve carbon goals, one of two back-to-back -back sessions on climate considerations. I will be moderating both. Um, I'm very excited for the panel and thrilled to be here. I'm gonna take a moment to introduce uh, myself and then uh, introduce our, our panelists. My name is Ben Soltoff. I'm an Environmental Innovation Manager at the Yale Center for Business and Environment, as well as an Environmental Innovation Fellow at the Sci Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale. And in short, I'm an Environmental Point Person at an Innovation Center, an Innovation Point Person at an Environmental Center, and I work with students from across the Yale ecosystem who are creating new ventures or just looking to apply innovative solutions to environmental problems, particularly at the intersection of private sector and sustainability. I am so excited for this panel and I'm really honored to be here with our with our two panelists. Uh, we've got Eva Gladick, the founder and CEO of Metabolic, and Anna Vinogradova, the director uh, of sustainability at Walmart. Um, because we only have 25 minutes and it's a really rapid fire session about these um, alignment and potential trade-offs between circularity and carbon goals, I wanna just turn it right over to our panelists. And my first question is, you know, my, my introduction was brief. Please take a moment to introduce yourselves to the audience. What's your background and, and what's your current role and responsibilities? Uh, why don't we start with Anna? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, sorry, uh, with Eva. Uh, Wait, did you say with me or with Anna? I said Anna. Okay, that's great. Um, Going hi, alphabetically. That's perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, Anna Vinogradova, and I'm director in uh, Walmart Global Sustainability Team. So I'm a subject matter expert for circular economy for a variety of programs and also lead our zero waste operational work and also responsible for our international strategy integration. Great. And I am Eva Gladek. I'm the founder and CEO of Metabolic. Metabolic is an ecosystem of organizations with one central mission, which is to transition the global economy to a fundamentally sustainable state. So we have a consultancy, a think tank, a software arm, a foundation that works with communities and a, a ventures arm, and these all work together in different ways toward that mission. Um, we're broadly seen as a circular economy uh, expert organization, and we've done lots of different projects with cities as well as um, corporations in advancing their objectives to moving toward a circular economy. Great. Well, thank you both for introducing yourselves. Uh, thank you for, for being here. Those of you who are watching, feel free to drop in the chat your name and where you're joining from, uh, and you can do a, an introduction of, of yourselves as well. Great to see that we've currently got 122 people watching this session. My next question for the panelists is, is kind of tied to that initial introduction, but I think a really important start point for any, any discussion of, of circularity why are you here? You know, what brings you to this conference of circularity and why is the circular economy important to you as an individual and to the company that you work for? Let's start with Anna again there. Yeah, so uh, the Walmart circular economy vision really has grown from our uh, zero waste operational efforts. Uh, we've learned a lot in our own operation as we set up our zero waste goal and really learning about circular economy has allowed us to apply all of these learnings and expand that vision in the way and to engage our suppliers and our customers. So personally, I am really passionate about circular economy topic and it really gives um, an opportunity to view the value of the material of any material that we're using and to show that we want to keep it in play for as long as possible. But even broader, it really brings lots of models and system, um, system change um, solutions that we really need to, um, to move to a sustainable future. Yeah, and as for me, um, it's also definitely a personal passion. Um, my entire organization is focused on advancing circularity and sustainability and equity in, um, in the kind of structuring of a new economic model, which is what we need to get to. Um, I started out my career as a molecular geneticist working in research labs, and I realized through that process of um, becoming really specialized in a small area that um, that wasn't impacting the bigger societal issues that we're facing now as uh, as humanity. And I progressively retooled my career in that direction and, and founded Metabolic. And that is our entire mission, which is this way of thinking. And I think um, 
in, in terms of the circular economy specifically, if you look at the natural world and uh, these biological systems from which we've emerged, they are by definition circular. Everything, if you walk through a forest, all the different leaves and plants and uh, insects, uh, they are all continuously consuming one another and, and going in, in, uh, in these endless cycles. And we are smart enough as humanity to design an economy that also functions that way, that continues to generate value and preserves um, the complexity of materials as they cycle through the system. Uh, so for, for my next question, I want to follow up with you, Eva, on that point, because you're, you're talking about these systemic shifts in the economy and the transition to a circular economy really does entail rethinking processes at every step of a product life cycle and, and multiple sectors and, and facets of the economy. So if we're taking a 10,000 foot view on the shift to a circular economy, um, where do the changes that are necessary align with economy wide greenhouse gas reduction and where might they clash? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so as far as we're concerned, the circular economy is actually a prerequisite for achieving decarbonization. And that's for multiple reasons. Um, first of all, if you look at the total embodied emissions uh, in all the products that we consume, um, they actually comprise 45% or almost half of all the carbon emissions that we're responsible for as an economy or as humanity. So we can't just be looking at energy um, efficiency and energy savings. We also really have to look at how we're making products, how we're using them over time. Um, but secondly, and this is something that people don't think about so often, um, even to achieve the IPCC climate objectives, so building the uh, renewable infrastructure that we need, so the solar panels and the wind turbines, requires a huge amount of material that we're currently not very good at getting back out of the system. So lots of rare metals and um, critical materials that are currently um, getting dead ended through poor uh, product design and recycling practices. So we actually need to figure out how to manage these materials in a circular way to actually achieve these um, climate objectives. There are potentially places that the uh, two objectives of circularity and uh, carbon emissions reductions can clash. Um, but that's only if you don't look at circularity in a systemic perspective. It shouldn't be seen as recycling 2.0. It's really about redesigning entire value chains, changing the way that different stakeholders work together, how incentives are structured in systems and business models. And that starts also with fundamentally thinking about product design, not just from a single life cycle, but from many life cycles. And if you take that systemic perspective, then you can start to avoid the points of potential clash where let's say recycling might end up being less carbon um, efficient than uh, virgin material use, which is actually quite rare, and occur but can occur through circumstances where you have poorly designed value chains. But I'm sure we can get into that a little more in uh, the discussion. Yes, I uh, will definitely go into some of those trade-offs and, and some of the kind of larger scale um, systemic uh, shifts. Um, but I want to get a little more specific right now and focus on, on one company, albeit one of the largest companies on the planet. Uh, and let's go to, to Anna. What, what goals has Walmart set on the circular economy? Uh, what about on uh, emissions reduction? And, and how do you see alignment between those two areas? Yeah, so we have a significant set of commitments within the climate change and the circular economy area. And it's really when we were developing uh, emission target, that's when we, I think, started to really clearly realize how both of them are connected. So in circular economy space, um, so we are committed to achieve zero waste now on operations by 2025. We're also working with our private brand suppliers uh, on making our packaging 100% recyclable or usable. Um, reduce the usage of the virgin plastics and educate customers on how to recycle more. On the carbon space, um, so for our scope one and scope two emissions, we have the goal of reducing our um, emissions on by 18% by 2025, which is in alignment with science-based target. And then in the scope three for our value chain, so we've committed to work with our suppliers to reduce 1 billion of metric tons of CO2 from our global value chain by 2030. And so this is our scope three emission goal. And this is what many of you have heard as a project gigaton. So really, as we were developing project gigaton, so we realized that we want for it to be kind of an umbrella uh, uh, platform where we connect all the different supply chain efforts and tie them back into the carbon reduction space. And so for across the five key pillars that we're currently have in the project gigaton, 
two of them are directly connected to circular economy. So one, it's the waste and the packaging. So for the waste pillar, so we are allowing suppliers to report the improvements, um, like the waste management improvements in their operations and supply chain and see the carbon reductions associated with that. On the packaging side, so uh, our suppliers can see the carbon reductions associated with using recycled content, switching from one material to another material, uh, putting the recycling labels, or just eliminating material altogether, like switching to reusable models. So really what we did on the back end of the project Gigaton, so we developed a set of uh, calculators to allow for that, right? To allow the suppliers, like in this case, to come with cer certain indicators, which would be more considered as a circular economy indicators, right? And put them in. And we, in the back end, can convert that on the carbon emission reduction. And so it really it made it really easy because some of our suppliers don't have these tools or opportunities to really do that on their own. So they basically just come to us with what they have. And we are allowing this tool, which they can use for reporting, but also they can use it for some of the decision making, right? If they're switching from some material to another, they can actually use that tool and see how that would impact some of the uh, carbon parameters. Great. Um, yeah, thank you for that overview, Anna, for kind of how those um, different goals are connected and the, the ways that you're, you're working closely with suppliers and giving them some of the frameworks to, to make decisions for themselves. I want to bring it back to, to Evan now, because I know you work with a lot of companies. Uh, how does Walmart's approach compare to other companies that, that you work with and that you've seen um, making similar carbon and circularity goals? Yeah, so I mean, in lots of ways, um, it's quite similar, which is a good thing. It means that we're on the right track. Um, I think there have been a lot of trends in recent years to move towards science-based target setting for carbon, um, but also extending science-based target setting for other areas like um, land use, biodiversity, et cetera, through, through these different um, programs that are now emerging. And um, many companies uh, are just now setting circular economy goals for the first time. And once they do, they clearly see the connection between those objectives and the decarbonization objectives that they have because they can also, um, most of the uh, science-based targets uh, targets that are being set include scope three emissions and that is also indeed where all of your material input starts getting calculated and factored into your your footprint so these two things are starting to bounce off of one another and more and more organizations are, are setting them in parallel yeah thanks for thanks for giving us that broader broader context of, of what other companies are doing i want to go back now to this issue of of trade-offs um, you know, particularly in the kind of smaller scale trade-offs when, uh, when a given company is making decisions uh, like Walmart about setting, setting goals for what products to use and, and uh, guidance on that. Uh, are there trade-offs between the emissions currently embedded in the, in the raw materials versus what's, what's generated throughout a product life cycle, including, including at the end of life? And, and how do you tackle those trade-offs? And, and, and how about you, you start off with those trade-offs? Yeah, absolutely. So I think a few, a probably a good example, you know, to go into it's the discussions that we are he having on our um, like produce or like just a fresh food area and the packaging that is related to the area. So that they come to the point where you're comparing the emissions from the potential food waste or spoilage, right, or like reduction of some days of freshness versus like using um using certain material and usually it's a like flexible films right it's uh, it's it's a plastic packaging that lots of our customers and lots of our stakeholders want to go away right you're hearing people a lot about wanting to see like loose produce and so like for people to feeling that like this is the move towards sustainable future while when we're usually comparing that and so one you know it's like all of our sustainability experts i think they're like the wrapped cucumbers right in the like in the store so whenever we see that so it's something that like nobody likes but the fact that you actually like wrap cucumber on a few grams of the plastic foil of plastic film um allows them to stay fresh for 14 days on the shelf where usually like you would never achieve that with well, that without the packaging 
So for these areas, and I would say we always consider that, I would say at this moment, the food waste and food waste prevention definitely being more important for us. And we're being very, very careful, you know, removing packaging there. But at the same time, this is actually a great place for innovation. And so just an example, you know, for the produce. So we are actually piloting with a few organizations who are doing the uh, plant-derived um, applications for for the produce that allows them allows to extend the shelf life where you eliminate the need of the plastic packaging altogether and you actually create more natural um, coating for for the products but um, absolutely I would say in that case LCA you know and the emissions uh, it's more important and so that's why we're choosing the kind of food waste piece but at the same time that really pushes us to innovate. I'm really glad that you uh, raised that cucumber example, Anna. It's one of the examples that I use in lots of my presentations because it is everyone's gut reaction to see a cucumber wrapped in, in a plastic film and say, well, that's obviously bad for the environment. Why is this happening? And these trade-offs do exist. And currently, um, when it comes to carbon emissions, it's been estimated that food waste um, contributes to around 10% of global carbon emissions just because of the um, decomposition of that, that food waste in landfills, et cetera, and the embodied emissions. But there are um, other kind of trade-off questions that um, have to do with packaging and, um, and carbon emissions as a whole. So uh, we're about to release a study um, that actually one of my colleagues who I saw is on uh, in the audience um, is the lead author of where we looked at the impacts of different packaging materials for in the beverage sector specifically. And one of the things that you can clearly see is that um, recycling is not always uh, the best solution. It doesn't, so if you're, if you're comparing, for example, glass, aluminum, and PET, the benefits of recycling aluminum in terms of carbon emissions are massive. You get a 95% reduction, up to a 95% reduction in the impact um, carbon impact if you recycle that material. But for glass, it's much smaller because the glass is heavy, uh, difficult to transport, takes a lot of energy to crush. So you really need to go to refilling models as a top priority. And, and that's um, that's a, the most optimal way to do it. So it's also about looking at the, the system, life cycles, um, and in general, carbon benefits from recycling. But if you consider the context, like if you have to transport Material that's not very common from very far away um, to a central recycling facility, then the emissions of all that transport will add up to potentially outweighing the benefits of the recycling. So it really is about the systems design perspective when you're looking at these different types of trade-offs. But can you share an example of how some of those those trade-offs might be lessened if the system is, is more amenable to a circular economy? Yeah, of course. I mean, this example that I gave of um, a material that is maybe not available in large enough volume to have many different recycling facilities. Well, if you actually start to um, optimize packaging or really consider um, total volumes of packaging, like if there was coordination between different parties that are producing packaging to move it toward a smaller number of typologies so that you can get the critical mass um, and have more recycling facilities that are specialized for this type of material um, distributed around, then you also cut the reverse logistics costs of that. You can better coordinate around the, the collection um, or better yet even move to just re reusable systems uh, with washing. So, so it really is around um, coordination across supply chains, across different producers, um, making sure that we're moving in the same direction toward the same vision and uh, facilitating economies of scale for the right types of solutions that we've decided, okay, these are the, the ways to go. Great. Uh, thanks for, for those examples. Uh, I'm seeing some, some questions pop up in the chat. I, I'd encourage you, if you have more questions, to, to keep asking asking those there, and I'll, I'll try to pick up a cup, uh, maybe, maybe at least one of them. Um, but bef before that, I, I just want to ask, you know, there have been engineering uh, and technology challenges you've raised, kind of, you know, transitioning from maybe a plastic coating to um, a, a more organic-based coating that uh, uh, increases the lifespan of a food product. And then there's also systemic uh, and collaboration problems of kind of getting different actors to, um, to work with one another um, in kind of recycling systems and in transportation systems, moving things close to each other. To what extent do you see kind of the engineering as the bigger barrier versus to what extent do you see the, the collaboration and, and just getting, you know, different actors to work together as, as the barrier? Um, I realize it's both, but kind of how do you see both of those playing out in practice? Uh, why don't we start with Anna? 
Yeah, I think I think there are there are definitely it's definitely both. Uh, but I feel like from the like the technology solutions and technology innovations are really the key to drive this area forward. So I feel like if there are the innovations are appearing, so you know, on the non-technical space, you can you can pull stakeholders together, you know, and you can explain it in the way that it would be implemented, you could pilot it. So I feel like from the unlocking opportunities, so that's where like where we need like lots of innovations. And and we're seeing lots of innovations. And I think the then the challenge sometimes that we're seeing, like you know, as a big company um with different like materials and technologies are appearing that we don't always see a good set of like certification you know or like a science behind them that would be enough for us to really take that on and start piloting that and then on another hand you have a very large group of stakeholders that we're working with so you have buyers operators right um, you have our customers who are hearing about the solutions and they potentially could think so this is the solution right so they're bringing that sometimes they go you know without checking that with sustainability team and try to pilot that the biodegradable you know could be like could be lo lots of discussions there but i think that's that's sometimes it's an issue that sometimes you know and like even like our customers would hear and would naturally feel that certain solution is more sustainable while like from the science perspective we know that it's not right from the whole like life cycle analysis so i think that's actually like where we have like lots of kind of this challenging you know making sure that we educate everyone but at the same time not becoming a barrier really there because there are so many complications and there are kind of there are so many caveats right to every implementation of every solution so for us it's like you know how do we drive the progress with our like buyers operators at the same time like while like keeping them keeping ourselves true to the science yeah and i mean i think um i i definitely recognize everything you're saying there anna but a lot of the kind of um technological uh challenges are intertwined with more organizational challenges so you may have a really great technology but you can't get it financed unless you get um enough players in the market to cooperate and say, okay, well, this is the, the solution that we want to test out and put money in. So there's, for example, this really interesting company here in the Netherlands called Ionica that has, um, they use ferrofluid, nano ferrofluid to separate plastics from one another. So they're basically able to, on a kind of molecular level, pull PET apart from even dyes and other things. Um, and, you know, they need to get to scale, but in order for that to happen, they need a lot of parties to come together and say, okay, we'll, we'll invest in a pilot plant so we can actually test this. And then there's a feedback loop between that technology and the whole LCA side of things, because we don't know at scale how efficient it's going to be in terms of energy use, et cetera, until you get to that level. So there's all these different um, interplays. And I think there needs to be a very, there should be quite a strong vision driving forward all of, all of this. Like, what are we ultimately all trying to get to? And if we can agree on the performance outcomes of what we want, so an economy where no resources are, are wasted, at least not, not structurally, and if we all say, okay, well, this is the design objective that we're giving ourselves, then that gives a lot more space for these different elements to fall in line, both on the technological, on the stakeholder, and the financial side, because we know what we're investing in jointly. Great. Um... Thanks for those those answers. I've been looking in the in the chat uh, and trying to find some some common themes in the in the questions there. Uh, one thing I, I saw in, in a couple of questions is kind of those those elements of, of consumer behavior and choices that can um, influence the shift to a circular economy. So you know, keeping products for longer, you know, bringing reusable containers, buying things local, not produced in a hothouse, but maybe just from, from local local farms that, that don't use as much energy. You know, for some of those those choices that consumers can can make on, on their end, how can other actors in the in the system enable enable those choices going forward? Yeah, I think I that, you know, so um, reusable, like, you know, like reusable packaging and so kind of a new solution. So that's really something that we're trying to pilot around the globe a lot. And so, you know, like all of us talk about the reusable packaging, but in reality, there are not so much data available on how customers at this time would behave to that. And, you know, more like our like regular Walmart customer. So what we are trying to do, it's actually, so what we call them like a test and learn stores where we are introducing like a refill solutions or for example, we are 
actually like introducing the loose produce, right? So we're like strapping out like all the packaging, like in produce and flowers. Uh, we're introducing a better like recycling centers for customers. And really what we're looking is to understand their behavior, you know, and see which of the specific models would actually work for which product, you know, what better work for rice, what better work mm -hmm. for uh, like, you know, sugar or milk. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, so I'm currently involved in this um, whole working group on consumers beyond disposability, which is also really largely focused on how do you get people to change their behavior and, and shift into this new model. But not only that, what role can cities and companies play in, in uh, facilitating this? And I do think it's really quite a significant um, move. But um, one of the most important things that we need to do is just uh, I think try it um, to really have more pilots and, and really just start with small scale experiments with maybe certain product lines or and, and just start to actually see how people are reacting get more data and through the process of making it more common and, and experienced um, achieve a certain mindset shift in people so it, it's a pity there are so many great questions in the um, sidebar I would love to answer all of them but I don't think we're ever going to have a chance, right? So is there yeah, any way I, that we can engage with the uh, questions after this is over? Um, I, I don't know if you can go back to seeing them, but if you find names, you can message them directly. There's a, you can message anyone who's participating in circularity. Um, but I'm seeing we're at 126, we're, we're a minute over. This time really flew by. Thank you both for your, your insightful questions. Before we wrap up, Please um, add any, our panelists, please add any resources you'd like to share into the chat, uh, as well as, you know, if you'd like folks to, to follow up with you, how they can do so um, as, as we wrap up. And um, folks who are, who, are, who are watching this, um, keep an eye out for those. I see that Anna had her, her links ready to go. I'm going to put in my, uh, my LinkedIn and, and Twitter if, you, if you'd like to follow up with me. Um, and I just want to, as we wrap up, extend a huge thank you to Anna and Eva for being here for the conversation, for kind of going from the, the bird's eye view into the nitty gritty of these interrelationships between circularity and emissions reduction. If you're curious about this topic, you want to keep the conversation going, you're in luck. There's another climate considerations panel immediately after this. I'm going to hop on there right now. That's going to focus specifically on packaging, and we'll have representatives from Coca-Cola and Tetra Pak, Tetra Pak talking about how um, packaging can align emissions reductions and uh, circular economy. So I hope to see some of you there. I'm going to hop off now. Thank, to, thank you to those of you who are here, to our joining. And again, a big thank you to our panelists for being here. Enjoy the rest of the conference and take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Anna. And anyone who wants to reach out is welcome to do so via LinkedIn. So you can Absolutely. find me there. Yeah, the same here. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you. Bye, everyone.